It's 1952, and Charlie Chaplin is on the Queen Elizabeth Ocean Liner, heading from New York to London to premiere his new film, Limelight, when he receives a telegram from the Attorney General of the United States. It says that he is no longer allowed back into America. The country's most famous and recognizable man was exiled. Charlie Chaplin's life is better than a movie. Raised in an orphanage, he became the most famous man in the world. Yet, there's also a much darker demon to Charlie Chaplin, a man who chased younger girls, and who was investigated by J. Edgar Hoover for communist leanings, forced to live out his final days in solitude in Lake Geneva. The shocking true story of Charlie Chaplin will amaze you. Charlie's childhood was a life filled with such poverty and hardship that it makes his eventual trajectory the most dramatic of all rags to riches stories ever told. Born in 1889 in the dirty streets of London, his father, Charles Sr., was gone from his life before he could talk. And his mother, Hannah Chaplin, who had a brief and unsuccessful stage career, was left with no money. She raised Charlie and his older brother, Sidney, in extreme poverty completely unable to care for them. By the age of only seven, Charlie had been sent to live in a workhouse, an orphanage-style home for children. Though he would occasionally see his mother, he would bounce from workhouse to workhouse. When Charlie was nine, his mother Hannah was committed to the Cane Hill Mental Institution. Between his time in the workhouses and caring for his mother succumbing to mental illness, Charlie began to perform on stage. But Charlie's interests were not in singing. Vaudeville was a growing form of live entertainment at the time, and he dreamed that one day he could have a life on stage doing comedy. To Charlie, comedy offered an escape from what was the miserable reality of his everyday life. He and his brother Sidney supported themselves with a range of jobs while also pursuing his ambition to perform. At 14, shortly after his mother's relapse, he registered with a theatrical agency in London's West End. The manager sensed potential in Charlie, and he was given his first role on stage as a newsboy. The show opened in July 1903, but was unsuccessful and closed after only two weeks. Charlie's comic performance, however, was praised in many of the reviews. Charlie's brother Sidney managed to find decent work as an actor, and when Sidney joined Fred Carnot's comedy company in 1906, he quickly became one of their key performers and Sidney suggested Fred consider his younger brother, Charlie, for a two-week trial. On the very first night, Charlie won over the room at the London Coliseum, and he was signed to a full contract. Charlie began by playing a series of minor parts, eventually progressing to starring roles, and in 1909, would take their routine to America. In America, Charlie was one of the best performers in Fred Carnot's comedy troupe. His sketch as a drunk, called The Inebriate Swell, drew huge laughs from the crowds every night. By now, Charlie was 19 and had moved well past his poverty-stricken days in the streets of London, finding himself hobnobbing with people of power in the rising world of silent pictures. He was scouted for the film industry and began appearing for Keystone Studios, the makers of the Keystone Cops. Charlie thought the Keystone comedies were crude, but he liked the idea of working in motion pictures. In 1913, he signed a contract with Keystone for $150 a week, a first-class salary back then when the average working immigrant earned less than $25 a week. Charlie's boss was the legendary producer-director of the silent era, Max Sennett, who initially expressed concern that the 24-year-old looked too young. So Charlie wasn't used in a film for several months. But Charlie took his time on the sidelines as an opportunity to learn the process of filmmaking. His first film, a one-reeler called Making a Living, marked his film acting debut and was released in February 1914. Charlie hated the film, but the reviews singled him out as a fresh comedian. And it was his second appearance on camera that would thrust him into the world the way we know him today. Going through the costume room to find a fresh character for his next movie, he looked for a way to bring who he was into the comedy. That is, a poor street tramp down on his luck. He said he wanted everything to be a contradiction, so he chose baggy pants, but a tight-fitting coat, a small hat, but large shoes. 
He added a small mustache to make himself look older, and as he looked at himself in the mirror, working out quirky mannerisms, he had no idea that he was giving birth to a character that would change his life. The moment he began walking with a cane and signature waddle, he knew who this character was. A happy, lovable, innocent tramp, down on his luck, but with the hope of a better life. The film was Mabel's Strange Predicament, and over the next several movies, he continued to improve the nuances of the Tramp character. Ironically, film directors were not a fan of Charlie's Tramp. And after many on-set clashes with directors, Max Sennett considered releasing Charlie from his contract. However, the public loved him. When Max Sennett received orders from movie theaters for more Tramp films, not only did Mac keep him on, he also allowed Chaplin to direct his next film himself, earning $1,500 for the film. Caught in the Rain in May 1914 was Chaplin's directorial debut, and it was a success. Thereafter, Charlie directed almost every short film in which he appeared for Keystone. Charlie Chaplin films were different from the normal slapstick farces from the Keystone cops. His films were a slower form of comedy, and it was something about the Tramp character that was different than most comedies at the time, which were very joke-heavy. Charlie's Tramp felt like a lost dog or child, and his actions seemed both hilarious and deeply familiar to an audience who was just trying to make their own ends meet, and the public couldn't get enough of him. When Charlie's contract came up for renewal at the end of the year, he asked for $1,000 a week, an amount Mac Sennett refused as he thought it was too large. But when the SNA Film Company of Chicago sent Charlie an offer of $1,250 a week and a signing bonus of $10,000, he left Mac Sennett to join their studio. By now, Charlie was a success and had the power to exert a high level of control over his pictures, and he started to put more time and care into each film. He also began to alter his screen persona. The character became more gentle and romantic, but it was these turns away from the two-dimensional characters in slapstick comedy that made the critics begin to truly appreciate his work. And by 1915, Charlie Chaplin became a cultural phenomenon. Shops were stocked with Tramp merchandise. He was featured in cartoons and comic strips. A journalist for Motion Picture Magazine wrote that Chaplinitis had spread across America. As his fame grew worldwide, he became the film industry's first international star. And capitalizing on his fame, when his SNA contract ended in December 1915, Charlie, fully aware of his popularity, requested a $150,000 signing bonus from his next studio. He received several offers, including Universal, Fox, and Vitagraph, the best of which came from the Mutual Film Corporation. He negotiated a contract with Mutual that amounted to $670,000 a year, making Charlie Chaplin, at 26, one of the highest paid people in the world. The high salary shocked the public, but the head of Mutual Film Corporation said, we can afford to pay Mr. Chaplin this sum annually because the public wants Mr. Chaplin and will pay for him. It was true. Charlie Chaplin was a bankable star. The first time that the world got to know the concept of a rich and famous A-list movie star. To understand just how popular Charlie Chaplin's tramp character was, consider this. He was loved by everyone in the world. And the name Charlie Chaplin was part of the common language of almost every country, and his tramp image was universally recognizable. In 1917, it was reported that nine out of 10 people who attended costume parties went as the tramp. He was a global obsession. And mind you, this was 10 years before Mickey Mouse or any other character that would one day be in the public consciousness. The mutual contract stipulated that he release a short two reel film every four weeks which he easily managed to achieve. But as time went on, and the public continued to see picture after picture with the Tramp, Charlie began to demand more time to make his movies. In 1917, he only made four movies with Mutual over the course of 10 months, but they were all successful. When Charlie's contract was up with Mutual, Charlie turned to his brother Sidney to become his business manager. The two brothers who were once living in child workhouses in London were now the toast of Hollywood. And Sidney was an excellent manager for his brother Charlie, telling all the studios clamoring to get in business with him that Charlie must be allowed all the time he needs and all the money he needs for producing the films the way he wants. A few months later, 
June 1917, Charlie signed with First National Exhibitors Circuit to make eight films in return for $1 million. He built his own studio situated on five acres of land off Sunset Boulevard near La Brea, incidentally now owned by Jim Henson as the home of the Muppets. And Charlie was given total freedom over the making of his pictures, and so he decided to get into full-length movies. First National was getting frustrated with Charlie Chaplin. Yes, they had essentially given him a blank check to make movies, but Charlie could feel their hesitation as he asked for more and more money. And Charlie was too big a star to be told no. By now, there were a few other actors starting to make their names in Hollywood. Douglas Fairbanks, a good-looking swashbuckler in pirate movies, was gaining stardom, as was America's sweetheart, the first leading lady of movies, Mary Pickford. Together, the three of them, along with the movie director D.W. Griffith, the man credited with making the first feature-length film, Birth of a Nation, formed a new distribution company in 1919 called United Artists. The arrangement was revolutionary in the film industry, as it enabled the four partners, all creative artists, to personally fundraise for their own pictures and have complete control, ownership, and share in the profits. Up until this moment, actors were just paid to act and had no control and ownership of their work or likeness. But Charlie Chaplin had the power to change the Hollywood business model. Charlie loved the idea of having his own company. But there was another thing that Charlie loved just as much. Women. And specifically, much younger women. As United Artists was forming, a 30-year-old Charlie met his first of four wives, the 16-year-old actress Mildred Harris who had revealed that she was pregnant with his child. They married quietly so as to avoid controversy that he impregnated an underage girl. However, soon after the marriage, the pregnancy was found to be false. Charlie was outraged, and he also felt that the controversy and the marriage trap stunted his creativity. But soon after, Mildred was pregnant again, and their son, Norman Chaplin, was born. However, Norman was not born normal and died after only living three days. Soon after, the marriage between Charlie and Mildred ended. Losing the child, plus Charlie's own childhood experiences as a lost child in the streets, are what influenced him as he made his first feature-length tramp film, the classic silent picture, The Kid. If you haven't seen the movie The Kid, you must. A mix of comedy and drama, the tramp becomes a father figure to a lost four-year-old boy living in the streets. The film deals with issues of parent-child separation, and it's incredible. Four-year-old actor Jackie Coogan delivers one of the best child performances I have ever seen. In its release in 1921, it was an instant success, and it elevated Charlie Chaplin and The Tramp into not just a famous comic face, but the auteur master storyteller of his day. Seriously, go see the kid. After the nuanced brilliance of The Kid, Charlie knew that his next film had to be epic. Inspired by a photograph of the 1898 Klondike Gold Rush and the tragic story of the Donner Party, Charlie made The Gold Rush, an epic comedy about tragedy. The Tramp is a lonely prospector fighting adversity and looking for love. With extensive locations, state-of-the-art filming techniques, and over 600 extras, it took 15 months to film and cost over $1 million. The Gold Rush became one of the highest grossing films of the silent era, earning $5 million in the U.S. alone. The film contains the now iconic comedy bits of Charlie's most famous sequences, including The Tramp Eating His Shoe and the classic Dance of the Rolls. And during production of The Gold Rush, Charlie married for the second time another teenage actress, Lita Gray. She was 16, he was 35. And like the first time, her surprise announcement of pregnancy forced Charlie into marrying her to avoid charges of statutory rape under California law. Their first son, Charlie Chaplin III, was born in 1925, the same year Charlie became the first movie star to be featured on a Time magazine cover. Their second son, Sidney Chaplin, was born a year later. But it was an unhappy marriage, and Charlie spent long hours at the studio to avoid seeing his wife. After only two years, she took the children and left. A bitter divorce followed, in which Lita accused Charlie of infidelity, abuse, and perverted sexual fetishes. When the story was leaked to the press, Charlie had a meltdown. 
As the story became headline news, and groups formed across America calling for Charlie Chaplin films to be banned. To avoid further scandal, Charlie's lawyers agreed to a cash settlement of $600,000, the largest awarded by an American court at the time. And fortunately, his fan base was strong enough to survive the incident, and it was soon forgotten. By now, the invention of sound in movies was becoming more and more popular, and for many actors of the silent screen, their careers would end as a result of talking pictures. Charlie was cynical about this new medium, believing that talkies lacked the artistry of silent films. He was also hesitant to change the formula that had brought him such success, and feared that giving the tramp a voice would limit his international appeal and make him less likable. He therefore rejected the new Hollywood craze and began working on a new silent film, hoping that his fame was powerful enough to overcome the need for a talkie. And he was right. His next film, City Lights, released in 1931, is regarded as one of his best works. City Lights followed the tramp as he falls in love with a blind flower girl and his efforts to raise money for her eye operation. Charlie poured through money, taking nearly two years to finish filming, working himself into a neurotic state of perfection. Though there was no talking, Charlie still took advantage of sound technology and recorded a musical score for the film, which he composed himself. By the time Charlie finished editing City Lights, silent films were basically gone. A preview for an audience was a failure, but the press gave it positive reviews. Released in 1931, City Lights proved to be a popular and financial success, eventually grossing over $3 million. The British Film Institute called it Charlie's finest accomplishment and hailed the final scene as the greatest piece of acting and the highest moment in movies. But the world was changing in the 1930s, and Charlie was about to change with it in more ways than one. Though City Lights had been a success, Charlie wasn't sure if he could make another movie without dialogue. And making the movie had been a lonely process. However, in 1932, the 43-year-old Charlie met 21-year-old actress Paulette Goddard, and the pair began a relationship that would last for 10 years. Not ready to commit to a new film yet, Charlie and Paulette traveled the world, meeting with the great thinkers and politicians of the day. And Charlie was becoming increasingly interested in world affairs. Many people in the United States were troubled by the state of labor in America. Before labor unions protected workers, when powerful capitalists such as Henry Ford and Andrew Carnegie began to control the unemployment levels of thousands of men in factories. Though Charlie was born in England, after 30 years now in America, he felt American, even though he never ever became officially an American citizen. And he felt that his tramp character needed to address the growing economic inequality in his next film, Modern Times. Modern Times was a satire on industrial life. He intended to use spoken dialogue, but changed his mind during rehearsals, using only sound effects and almost no speaking. Charlie's performance of a gibberish song, however, did give the tramp a voice for the first time ever on film. Though the film didn't hit the same box office numbers as previous hits, and many found it polarizing, Modern Times is still seen as one of Charlie Chaplin's classic films. However, in his next film, there was no escaping the politics. He was seeing in Europe a rise in socialism, fascism, and even communism. And in 1940, noticing the physical resemblance between the Tramp's mustache and Hitler, Charlie felt it made sense that the Tramp should satirize Adolf Hitler in The Great Dictator. The film would be a turning point for Charlie and one that he would never turn back. By boldly expressing his political beliefs in a film, Charlie was no longer a slapstick comic. He was becoming a political figure. Charlie spent two years developing the script and began filming in September 1939, six days after Britain declared war on Germany. This time Charlie used spoken dialogue, mainly because now he had no choice for audiences, but also because he recognized it as a better method for delivering a political message. Making a comedy about Hitler was controversial, but Charlie's financial independence allowed him to do what he wanted. The film was a comedy about Hitler and Jews, and it generated a lot of buzz, with one critic calling it the most eagerly awaited picture of the year. Charlie ended the film with a five-minute speech in which he looks directly into the camera 
and pleads against war and fascism. While many people look back at this film as the decline of Charlie Chaplin's popularity, it was one of the biggest moneymakers of the era, and The Great Dictator received five Oscar nominations, including Best Picture and Best Actor Charlie Chaplin. However, it would also open the door for all the unfortunate things that followed. In the mid-1940s, Charlie was yet again in trouble as a result of an affair with a much younger actress. The troubles came from an affair with an actress named Joan Barry. Joan didn't like Charlie's on-again, off-again ways of dating actresses, and she became obsessive. Charlie twice had her arrested after they separated for stalking him, but she didn't stop her obsession, announcing that she was pregnant with Charlie's child. Charlie denied the claim, but she filed a paternity suit against him. And this was just the beginning of his troubles, as by now, J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, who had been part of a movement to eradicate communism from America, had long been suspicious of Charlie Chaplin's political leanings. And Hoover used the opportunity of the paternity suit to generate negative publicity about Charlie. The FBI named Charlie in four indictments related to the paternity case, the most serious of which was an alleged violation of the Mann Act, which prohibits the transportation of women across state lines for sex. If found guilty, Charlie faced 23 years in prison. Though Charlie was acquitted of all charges, the damage to his image was done, and making movies was about to become increasingly more difficult. After Joan Barry's child, Carol Ann, was born in 1943, the paternity suit went to court, and Charlie was declared to be the father. Even though evidence from blood tests indicated that he wasn't the father, it was considered inadmissible, and the judge ordered Charlie to pay child support until Carol Ann turned 21. But things just kept getting worse for Charlie. Two weeks after the paternity suit was filed, it was announced that 54-year-old Charlie had married his newest actress, 18-year-old Una O'Neill, the daughter of American playwright Eugene O'Neill. Charlie said that Una was the love of his life, and they would stay married until his death, and they would have eight children together. But the optics of all of this, from the paternity suit to the FBI to 18-year-old Una, resulted in changes to Charlie Chaplin's public image. Charlie was also publicly accused of being a communist. His political activities heightened during World War II when he campaigned for an opening of a second front to help the Soviet Union and supported various Soviet-American friendship groups. Hoover and his FBI wanted Charlie Chaplin out of the country, launching an official investigation in early 1947. Their main suspicion was why, after all these years, the British Charlie Chaplin had come to America, lived the American dream, and yet never became or ever applied to be an American citizen. Charlie denied being a communist, but he was unwilling to be quiet about the issue. He openly protested against the trials of the Communist Party members and the activities of the House Un-American Activities Committee. Charlie even received a subpoena to appear before the HUAC committee, but was never called to testify. All his activities were widely reported in the press, and his Cold War fears grew. Questions were raised over his failure to take American citizenship, and calls were made for the great Charlie Chaplin to be deported. Charlie's next film, Limelight, was heavily autobiographical, alluding not only to Charlie's childhood and the lives of his parents, but also to his loss of popularity in the United States. And Charlie decided to hold the world premiere of Limelight in London, since that was the setting of the film. But only one day after he left aboard the Queen Elizabeth cruise liner with his family, he was told that the United States revoked his re-entry permit and he would not be allowed to return to America. Charlie didn't attempt to return to the United States after his re-entry permit was revoked and instead sent his wife Una to settle his affairs. The couple decided to settle in Switzerland and eventually moved to their permanent home, a 35-acre estate overlooking Lake Geneva. Charlie put his Beverly Hills house and studio up for sale, and the next year, his wife renounced her U.S. citizenship and became a British citizen. He then sold off all his remaining United Artists stock and severed his professional ties with the United States. Charlie lived a quiet life through the 1950s in Lake Geneva, writing his memoirs. But in the 1960s, in America, 
the political atmosphere began to change and attention was once again directed to Charlie Chaplin's films instead of his personal views. Cinema was going through a resurgence and critics began touting Charlie Chaplin not for his political views, but for his contribution to the world of cinema. In 1962, the New York Times published an editorial stating, we do not believe that America would be in danger if yesterday's unforgotten little tramp were allowed to come back to America. That same month, Charlie received an honorary doctorate from Oxford University. The world was changing their feelings about the great Charlie Chaplin. His work stood on its own and he was getting honored. However, his health started to decline following a series of strokes. In 1971, he received a high honor at the Cannes Film Festival and the following year at the Venice Film Festival. But perhaps the biggest and most important honor of the great Charlie Chaplin came in 1972 when the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences offered Charlie an honorary Oscar, inviting him to come to America to receive the award. He was initially hesitant about accepting, but decided to return to the U.S. for the first time in 20 years. The visit attracted massive press coverage, and at the Academy Awards, he was given a 12-minute standing ovation, the longest in the Academy's history. Visually emotional, he accepted his award for the incalculable effort he has made in making motion pictures the art form of this century. Soon after, he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II, though he would be too weak to kneel and receive the honor in his wheelchair. By October 1977, Charlie's health had declined to the point he was no longer able to get out of bed. In the early morning of Christmas Day 1977, Charlie died at home after having a stroke in his sleep. He was buried in Switzerland. He was 88 years old. But one more thing. A year later, Charlie's coffin was dug up and stolen from its grave. His body was held for ransom in an attempt to extort money from his widow, Una. Luckily, the thieves were caught in a large police operation, and Charlie's coffin was found buried in a field in a nearby village. Charlie Chaplin's life is by far the greatest rags-to-riches success story the world has ever seen. He created the idea of a Hollywood movie star, and he became the first actor to take control of the business side of his art. He inspired countless other people who pursue their dreams. And if you're interested in other biographies about A-list celebrities, check out these documentaries that you can watch right here, right now. Thank you so much for watching, and if you like what you saw, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss my future videos. I'll see you in the next one.